Brought to you by PrayLatin.com, makers of prayer cards featuring complete English phonetic renderings of Latin pronunciations. Today I have for you an interesting reflection that I am sort of dedicating informally to the Catholics who are watching this in Ireland. They often write to me and let me know about how things are going for the faithful in that country, and it brings to mind something Hilaire Belloc wrote in a larger work. He's Here he has, in the essay I have for you today, a reflection on how the British Empire abandoned the faith and abandoned Catholic Ireland and really what the effect of that was. And I'll have some more thoughts for that of that for you after these words by Hilaire Belloc. So without further ado. With this loss of an ancient province of the empire, Britain, one nation, and one alone, of those which the Roman Empire had not bred, stood the strain and preserved the continuity of Christian tradition. That nation was Ireland. Ireland presented an exception. It was not compelled to the Christian culture, as were the German barbarians of the continent, by arms. No Charlemagne with his Gallic armies forced into it tardily to accept baptism. It, it was not primitive like the Germanies, and it was therefore under no necessity to go to school. It was not a morass of shifting tribes, it was a nation, but in a most exceptional fashion, though already possessed, and perhaps because so possessed, of a high ancient culture of its own, it accepted within the lifetime of a man, St. Patrick, and by spiritual influences alone, the whole spirit of the creed. The civilization of the Roman West was accepted by Ireland, not as a command nor as an influence, but as a discovery. By the first third of the 17th century, Britain was utterly cut off from the unity of Christendom, and its new character was sealed. The Catholic faith had expired there. Its effect upon Europe was stupendous, for though England was cut off, England was still England. You could not destroy in a Roman province the great traditions of municipality and letters. It was though as though a phalanx of trained troops had crossed the frontier in some border war and turned against their former comrades. England lent, and has from that day continuously lent, the strength of a great civilized tradition, to forces whose original initiative was directed against European civilization and its tradition. The loss of Britain was the one great wound in the body of the Western world. It has not yet healed. Yet all this while that other island of the group to the northwest of Europe, that island which had never been conquered by armed civilization, as were the outer Germanies, but had spontaneously accepted the faith, presented a contrasting exception. Against the loss of Britain, which had been a Roman province, the faith, when the smoke of battle cleared off, could discover the astonishing loyalty of Ireland. And over against this exceptional province, Britain, now lost to the faith, lay an equally exceptional and unique outer part which had never been a Roman province, yet which now remained true to the tradition of Roman men. It balanced the map like a counterweight. The efforts to, sub to destroy the faith in Ireland had exceeded in violence, persistence, and cruelty any targeting in any part of the or time of the world. They have failed. As I cannot explain why they have failed, so I shall not attempt to explain how, and why the faith in Ireland was saved when the faith in Britain went under. I do not believe it capable of a, of a historic explanation. It seems to me a phenomenon essentially miraculous in character, not generally attached, as are all historical phenomena, to the general and divine purpose that governs our large political events, but directly and specially attached. It is of great significance. How great men will be able to see many years hence, when another definite battle is joined between the forces of the Church and her opponents. For the Irish people alone of all Europe has maintained a perfect integrity and has kept serene, without internal reactions and without their consequent disturbances, the soul of Europe, which is the Catholic Church. I have now nothing left to set down but the conclusion of this disaster, its spiritual result, an isolation of the soul, its secular result, the consequence of the spiritual, the prodig prodigious release of energy, the consequent advance of special knowledge, the subjection of the few under a competition left unrestrained, the subjection of the many the ruin of happiness, and the final threat of chaos. Clearly, what he's describing has, well, since changed for the people of Ireland. And so, instead of ruminating on the negativity, I will instead give you something that is from Hilaire Belloc that is joyful for the Irish, and that's his thoughts on St. Patrick. I know, it's just middle of June at this point, 
St. Patrick's Day was a couple of months ago, but I think this is a good time to reflect on the impact of that great saint in the history of Ireland. And it is in his hands, I think, in the hands of our Lord, that the fate of Ireland rests. And now, Hilaire Belloc on St. Patrick. If there is one thing that people who are not Catholic have gone wrong upon more than another in the intellectual things of life, it is the conception of a personality. They are muddled about it where their own little selves are concerned. They misappreciate it when they deal with the problems of society, and they have a very weak hold of it when they consider, if they do consider, the nature of Almighty God. Now, personality is everything. It was a personal will that made all things, visible and invisible. Our hope of immortality resides in this, that we are persons and half our frailties proceed from a misapprehension of the awful responsibilities where personality involves or a cowardly ignorance of his powers of self-government. The hundred and one errors which this main error leads to include a bad error on the nature of history. Your modern non-Catholic or opponent of the faith historian is always misunderstanding, underestimating or muddling the role played in the affairs of men by great and individual personalities. That is why he is so lamentably weak upon the function of legend. That is why he makes a fetish of documentary evidence and has no grip upon the value of tradition. For traditions spring from some personality invariably in the function of legend. Whether it be a rigidly true legend or one tinged with make-believe is to interpret personality. Legends have vitality and can continue because in their origin they so exactly serve to explain or illustrate some personal character in a man which no cold statement could give. Now, St. Patrick, the whole story and effect of him, is a matter of personality. There was once, 20 or 30 years ago, a whole school of dunderheads who wondered whether St. Patrick ever existed, because the mass of legends surrounding his name troubled them. How on earth, one wonders, do such scholars consider their fellow beings? Have they ever seen a crowd cheering a popular hero, or noticed the expression upon men's faces, when they speak of some friend or striking power recently dead? A great growth of legends around a man is the very best proof you could have not only of his existence, but of the fact that he was an origin and a beginning, and that things sprang from his will or his vision. There were some who seemed to think it a kind of favor done to the indestructible body of Irish Catholicism, when Mr. Burry wrote his learned Protestant book upon St. Patrick. It was a critical and very careful bit of work, and it was deservedly praised, but the favor done us I could not see. It is all to the advantage of non-Catholic history that it should be sane, and that a great pr Protestant historian should make true history out of a great historical figure was a very good sign. It was a long step back towards a common sense compared with the German absurdities which had left their victims doubting almost all the solid foundations of the European story. But as for us Catholics, we had no need to be told it. Not only was there a St. Patrick in history, but there is a St. Patrick on the shores of his eastern sea and throughout all Ireland today. It is a presence that stares you in the face and physically almost haunts you. Let a man sail along the Leinster Road on such a day as renders the Wicklow Mountains clear up weather behind him, and the Mourne Mountains, perhaps in storm, lifted clearly above the sea down the wind. He is taking some such course as that on which St. Patrick sailed, and if he will land from time to time from his little boat at the end of each day's sailing and hear mass in the morning before he sails further northward, he will know in what way St. Patrick inhabits the soil which he rendered sacred. We know that among the mark of holiness is the working of miracles. Ireland is the greatest miracle any saint ever worked. It is a miracle and a nexus of miracles. Among other miracles is a nation raised from the dead. The preservation of the faith by the Irish is a historical miracle compared to nothing else in Europe. There never was, and please God never can be, so pro prolonged and insane upheaval a targeting of men by their fellow men, as was undertaken for centuries against the faith in Ireland, and it has completely failed. I know of no example in history of failure following upon such effort. It had behind it in combination the most powerful of the evil passions of men, terror and greed. And so amazing is it that they did not attain their end, that perpetually as one reads, one finds the authors of the dreadful business now at one period, now at another assuming with certitude that their success is achieved. Then after centuries it is almost suddenly perceived, and in our own time, that it has not been achieved and never will be. What a complexity of strange coincidences combined, coming out of nothing, as it were, advancing like spirits summoned onto the stage, all to effect this end. Think of the American colonies. With one little exception, they were perhaps the most completely non-Catholic society of their time. Their successful leaving the mother country meant many things and led to many prophecies. Who could have guessed that one of its chief results would be the furnishing of a free refuge for the Irish? The 
The hunger all human opinion imagined and all human judgment was bound to conclude was a mortal wound, coming in as the ally of the vile targeting I have named. It has turned out the very contrary. From it there springs indirectly the dispersion, and that power which comes from unity and dispersion of Irish Catholicism, who, looking at the huge financial power that dominated Europe and England in particular, during the youth of our own generation, could have dreamt that in any corner of Europe, least of all in the poorest and most ruined corner of Christendom, an effective stalwart faith could be practiced. Behind the enemies of Ireland, furnishing them with all their modern strength, was that base and secret master of modern things, the usurer. It, he was far more than the gentry of the island who demanded toll, and through the mortgages on the Irish estates had determined to drain Ireland as he had drained and rendered desert so much else. Is it not a miracle that he has failed? Ireland is a nation risen from the dead. And to raise one man from the dead is surely miraculous and enough to convince one of the power of a great spirit. This miracle, as I am prepared to believe, is the last and the greatest of St. Patrick's. When I was last in Ireland, I bought in the town of Wexford a colored picture of St. Patrick, which greatly pleased me. Most of it was green in color, and St. Patrick wore a mitre and had a crozier in his hand. He was turning into the sea a number of nasty reptiles, snakes and toads and the rest. I bought this picture because it seemed to me as modern a piece of symbolism as I have ever seen, and that was why I bought it for my children and for my home. There was a few pence change, but I did not want it. The person who sold me the picture said they would spend the change in candles for St. Patrick's altar. So St. Patrick's is still alive. And there you have it. One wonders what Hilaire Belloc would think of Ireland today. And perhaps he's wrong about thing. one thing. Perhaps I, the last great miracle of St. Patrick was not the preservation of the faith during all those hard times in Ireland that he spoke of here. Perhaps, just perhaps, Ireland's, or the last great miracle of St. Patrick will be, the rebirth in the faith in Ireland that is sure to come. Thanks for listening. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.